section two of the three impostors by arthur Mackin. this librivox recording is in the public domain adventure of the gold tiberius the acquaintance between mr dyson and mr charles phillips arose from one of those myriad chances which are every day doing their work in the streets of london mr dyson was a man of letters and an unhappy instance of talents misapplied with gifts that might have placed him in the flower of his youth among the most favored of bentley's favorite novelists he had chosen to be perverse he was it is true familiar with scholastic logic but he knew nothing of the logic of life and he flattered himself with the title of artist when he was in fact but an idle and curious spectator of other men's endeavors among many delusions he cherished one most fondly that he was a strenuous worker and it was with a gesture of supreme weariness that he would enter his favorite resort a small tobacco shop in great queen street and proclaim to anyone who cared to listen that he had seen the rising and setting of two successive suns the proprietor of the shop a middle-aged man of singular civility tolerated dyson partly out of good nature and partly because he was a regular customer he was allowed to sit on an empty cask and to express his sentiments on literary and artistic matters till he was tired or the time for closing came and if no fresh customers were attracted it is believed that none were turned away by his eloquence dyson was addicted to wild experiments in tobacco he never wearied of trying new combinations and one evening he had just entered the shop and given utterance to his last preposterous formula when a young fellow of about his own age who had come in a moment later asked the shopman to duplicate the order on his account smiling politely as he spoke to mr dyson's address dyson felt profoundly flattered and after a few phrases the two entered into conversation and in an hour's time the tobacconist saw the new friends sitting side by side on a couple of casks deep in talk my dear sir said dyson i will give you the task of the literary man in a phrase he has got to do simply this to invent a wonderful story and to tell it in a wonderful manner i will grant you that said mr phillips but you will allow me to insist that in the hands of the true artist in words all stories are marvellous and every circumstance has its peculiar wonder the matter is of little consequence the manner is everything indeed the highest skill is shown in taking matter apparently commonplace and transmuting it by the high alchemy of style into the pure gold of art that is indeed a proof of great skill but it is great skill exerted foolishly or at least unadvisedly it is as if a great violinist were to show us what marvellous harmonies he could draw from a child's banjo no no you are really wrong i see you take a radically mistaken view of life but we must thresh this out come to my rooms i live not far from here it was thus that mr dyson became the associate of mr charles phillips who lived in a quiet square not far from holborn thenceforth they haunted each other's rooms at intervals sometimes regular and occasionally the reverse and made appointments to meet at the shop in queen street where their talk robbed the tobacconist profit of half its charm there was a constant jarring of literary formulas dyson exalting the claims of the pure imagination while phillips who was a student of physical science and something of an ethnologist insisted that all literature ought to have scientific basis by the mistaken benevolence of deceased relatives both young men were placed out of reach of hunger and so meditating high achievements idled their time pleasantly away and revelled in the careless joys of a bohemianism devoid of the sharp seasoning of adversity 
one night in june mr phillips was sitting in his room in the calm retirement of red lion square he had opened the window and was smoking placidly while he watched the movement of life below the sky was clear and the afterglow of sunset had lingered long about it the flushing twilight of a summer evening vied with the gas lamps in the square and fashioned a chiaroscuro that had in it something unearthly and the children racing to and fro upon the pavement the lounging idlers by the public house the casual passers-by rather flickered and hovered in the play of lights than stood out substantial things by degrees in the houses opposite one window after another leapt out a square of light now and again a figure would shape itself against a blind and vanish and to all this semi-theatrical magic the runs and flourishes of brave italian opera played a little distance off on a piano organ seemed an appropriate accompaniment while the deep muttered bass of the traffic of holborn never ceased phillips enjoyed the scene and its effects the light in the sky faded and turned to darkness and the square gradually grew silent and still he sat dreaming at the window till the sharp peal of the house bell roused him and looking at his watch he found that it was past ten o'clock there was a knock at the door and his friend mr dyson entered and according to his custom sat down in an armchair and began to smoke in silence you know phillips he said at length that i have always battled for the marvellous i remember your maintaining in that chair that one has no business to make use of the wonderful the improbable the odd coincidence in literature and you took the ground that it was wrong to do so because as a matter of fact the wonderful and the improbable don't happen and men's lives are not really shaped by odd coincidence now mind you if that were so i would not grant your conclusion because i think the criticism of life theory is all nonsense but i deny your premise a most singular thing has happened to me to-night really dyson i am very glad to hear it of course i oppose your argument whatever it may be but if you would be good enough to tell me of your adventure i should be delighted well it came about like this i have had a very hard day's work indeed i have scarcely moved from my old bureau since seven o'clock last night i wanted to work out that idea we discussed last tuesday you know the notion of the fetish worshipper yes i remember have you been able to do anything with it yes it came out better than i expected but there were great difficulties of uh, the usual agony between the conception and the execution anyhow i got it done about seven o'clock to-night and i thought i should like a little of the fresh air i went out and wandered rather aimlessly about the streets my head was full of my tale and i didn't much notice where i was going i got into those quiet places to the north of oxford street as you go west the genteel residential neighborhood of stucco and prosperity i turned east again without knowing it and it was quite dark when i passed along a sombre little by-street ill-lighted and empty i did not know at the time in the least where i was but i found out afterwards that it was not very far from tottenham court road i strolled idly along enjoying the stillness on one side there seemed to be the back premises of some great shop tier after tier of dusty windows lifted up into the night with gibbet-like contrivances for raising heavy goods and below large doors fast closed and bolted all dark and desolate then there came a huge pantechnican warehouse and over the way a grim blank wall as forbidding as the wall of a jail and then the headquarters of some volunteer regiment and 
afterwards a passage leading to a court where wagons were standing to be hired it was uh, one might almost say a street devoid of inhabitants and scarce a window showed the glimmer of a light i was wondering at the strange peace and dimness there where it must be close to some roaring main artery of london life when suddenly i heard the noise of dashing feet tearing along the pavement at full speed and from a narrow passage a mews or something of that kind a, a man was discharged as from a catapult under my very nose and rushed past me flinging something from him as he ran he was gone and down another street in an instant almost before i knew what had happened but i didn't much bother about him i was watching something else i told you he had thrown something away well i watched what seemed like a line of flame flash through the air and fly quivering over the pavement and in spite of myself i could not help tearing after it the impetus lessened and i saw something like a bright halfpenny roll slower and slower and then deflect toward the gutter hover for a moment on the edge and dance down into a drain i believe i cried out in positive despair though i hadn't the least notion of what i was hunting and then to my joy i saw that instead of dropping into a sewer it had fallen flat across two bars i stooped down and picked it up and whipped it into my pocket and i was just about to walk on when i heard again that sound of dashing footsteps i don't know why i did it but as a matter of fact i dived down into the mews or whatever it was and stood as much in the shadow as possible a man went by with a rush a few paces from where i was standing and i felt uncommonly pleased that i was in hiding i couldn't make out much feature but i saw his eyes gleaming and his teeth showing and he had an ugly-looking knife in one hand and i thought things would be very unpleasant for gentleman number one if the second robber or what you like caught him up i can tell you phillips a fox hunt is exciting enough when the horn blows clear on a winter morning and the hounds give tongue and the red coats charge away but it's nothing to a man-hunt and that's what i thought i had a slight glimpse of to-night there was murder in the fellow's eyes as he went by and i don't think there was much more than fifty seconds between the two i only hope it was enough dyson leant back in his armchair relit his pipe and puffed thoughtfully phillips began to walk up and down the room musing over the story of violent death fleeting in chase along the pavement the knife shining in the lamplight the fury of the pursuer and the terror of the pursued well he said at last and what was it after all that you rescued from the gutter dyson jumped up evidently quite startled oh, i really haven't a notion i didn't think of looking but we shall see he fumbled in his waistcoat pocket drew out a small and shining object and laid it on the table it glowed there beneath the lamp with the radiant glory of rare old gold and the image and the letters stood out in high relief clear and sharp as if it had but left the mint a month before the two men bent over it and phillips took it up and examined it closely imp period tiberius caesar augustus he read the legend and then looking at the reverse of the coin he stared in amazement and at last turned to dyson with a look of exultation do you know what you have found he said apparently a gold coin of some antiquity said dyson coolly quite so a gold tiberius no that is wrong you have found the gold tiberius look at the reverse dyson looked and saw the coin was stamped with the figure of a fawn standing amidst reeds and flowing water the features minute as they were stood out in delicate outline it was a face lovely and yet terrible and yet dyson thought of the well-known passage of the lad's playmate gradually growing with his growth and increasing with his stature 
till the air was filled with a rank fume of the goat yes he said it is a curious coin do you know it i know about it it is one of the comparatively few historical objects in existence it is all storied like those jewels we have read of a whole cycle of legends has gathered around the thing the tale goes that it formed part of an issue struck by tiberius to commemorate an infamous excess you see the legend on the reverse victoria it is said that by an extraordinary accident the whole issue was thrown into the melting pot and that only this one coin escaped it glints through history and legend appearing and disappearing with intervals of a hundred years in time and continents in place it was discovered by an italian humanist and lost and rediscovered it has not been heard of since seventeen twenty seven when sir joshua bird a turkey merchant brought it home from aleppo and vanished with it a month after he had shown it to the virtuosi no man knew or knows where and here it is put it into your pocket dyson he said after a pause i would not let anyone have a glimpse of the thing if i were you i would not talk about it did either of the men you saw see you well i think not i don't think the first man the man who was vomited out of the dark passage saw anything at all and i am sure that he could not have seen me and you couldn't really see them you couldn't recognize either one or the other if you met him in the street tomorrow no i don't think i could the street as i said was dimly lighted and they ran like madmen the two men sat silent for some time each weaving his own fancies of the story but lust of the marvellous was slowly overpowering dyson's more sober thoughts it is all more strange than i fancied he said at last it was queer enough what i saw a man is sauntering along a quiet sober everyday london street a street of grey houses and blank walls and there for a moment a veil seems drawn aside and the very fume of the pit steams up through the flagstones the ground glows red-hot beneath his feet and he seems to hear the hiss of the infernal cauldron a man flying in mad terror for his life and furious hate pressing hot on his steps with knife drawn ready here indeed is horror but what is all that to what you have told me i tell you phillips i see the plot thicken our steps will henceforth be dogged with mystery and the most ordinary incidents will teem with significance you may stand out against it and shut your eyes but they will be forced open mark my words you will have to yield to the inevitable a clue tangled if you like has been placed by chance in our hands it will be our business to follow it up as for the guilty person or persons in this strange case they will be unable to escape us our nets will be spread far and wide over this great city and suddenly in the streets and places of public resort we shall in some way or other be made aware that we are in touch with the unknown criminal indeed i almost fancy i see him slowly approaching this quiet square of yours he is loitering at street corners wandering apparently without aim down far-reaching thoroughfares but all the while coming nearer and nearer drawn by an irresistible magnetism as ships were drawn to the lodestone rock in the eastern tale i certainly think replied phillips that if you pull out that coin and flourish it under people's noses as you are doing at the present moment you will very probably find yourself in touch with the criminal or a criminal you will undoubtedly be robbed with violence otherwise i see no reason why either of us should be troubled no one saw you secure the coin and no one knows you have it 
i for my part shall sleep peacefully and go about my business with a sense of security and a firm dependence on the natural order of things the events of the evening the adventure in the street have been odd i grant you but i resolutely decline to have any more to do with the matter and if necessary i shall consult the police i will not be enslaved by a gold tiberius even though it swims into my ken in a manner which is somewhat melodramatic and i for my part said dyson go forth like a knight-errant in search of adventure not that i shall need to seek rather adventure will seek me i shall be like a spider in the midst of his web responsive to every movement and ever on the alert shortly afterwards dyson took his leave and mr phillips spent the rest of the night in examining some flint arrowheads which he had purchased he had every reason to believe that they were the work of a modern and not a paleolithic man still he was far from gratified when a close scrutiny showed him that his suspicions were well founded in his anger at the turpitude which would impose on an ethnologist he completely forgot dyson and the gold tiberius and when he went to bed at first sunlight the whole tale had faded utterly from his thoughts End of the adventure of the gold tiberius